I'm here in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, for a special edition of the Observer's Direct. We have lots of observers in the Haitian capital, and three of them are going to tell us about their town. Port-au-Prince, Haiti, capital of the poorest country in the Americas. Hit by a devastating earthquake in 2010, then cholera and hurricanes, the country has a hard time advancing. Unemployment is rife, and political instability keeps investment away. Demonstrations in November over government corruption left people dead in the streets, and the city shut down for a week. It's the reality for two and a half million residents of the capital region, including our three observers. Aristide Deland, 29, a specialist in religion. Nieps Zephyrin, 37, product manager at a bank. And Jenny Cadet, 26, an actress. With only about a third of the population in stable jobs, religion takes on a special significance. Religion is really important for Haitians. They spend a lot of time in church, a lot. Services can go on for four, five, six hours. How's that possible? Many Haitians have a lot of time on their hands because they don't have jobs. Catholicism has traditionally been dominant, but Haitians have been shifting to Protestant churches for years, evangelical denominations like Baptist and Pentecostal. Since the earthquake, many have turned to preachers who use techniques that are dramatic and sometimes controversial. Nieps told us about one who calls himself the modern shepherd. You can see the pastor in this video. He's throwing around a child he's treating for some sort of mystical illness. It's to get rid of the evil spirits. The modern shepherd was arrested for child endangerment, but released a week later. Our second observer, Aristilde, takes us to see another preacher who's making waves, self-proclaimed prophet Mackinson Dorilas. His office opens at 7 a.m. and there are already people waiting. Jonas Beto has brought his son in for a consultation. He says he's had a fever for a week. What he doesn't say and what we don't know is that his 16-month-old son is in fact dead. There's something wrong with him. He doesn't look good. Jonas later tells us his son died while they were already on their way with his wife and their other son, who's two months old. Why did you come here and not go to the hospital? I don't think it's a natural illness. Prophet Mackinson is an up-and-coming preacher. His services, complete with dramatic healings, last for hours. <laughs> He broadcasts them to more than 70,000 followers on Facebook, many of them from the Haitian diaspora in the US. He regularly talks to them from the front seat of his luxury SUV. Jonas and his wife have scraped together the 2,500 gourds the Prophet charges for a consultation, a huge amount for them, equivalent to one month of the average national income. What's the problem? There are bad spirits where we live. They get in through the roof. Is he sleeping? I saw his eyes roll back. Prophet Mackinson takes the baby's arm. He realizes there's no pulse. I borrowed money from my brother to come here. He gives them his diagnosis. Does either of you play the lottery? We used to. Not anymore. Someone has sold him to the devil so they can win the lottery. We'll pay, whatever it takes. He tells them to wait outside. Since the earthquake, people have been looking for someone, something, a higher being, to help them. We have Christianity here and Vodou. 
There are lots of Christians who also practice Vodou. They hold on to their Vodou beliefs. There are people who take advantage of this. They're smart. They say, OK, I'm going to start a church. They have nothing to do with Christianity. They might have studied a bit of theology, but they don't believe it. They see it as a job. They become a pastor or a prophet to make money. Prophet Mackinson had been enthusiastic to give us an interview, even boasting about it to his followers. But when we show up for a service at the new church he's constructing, no one is there. It's the same story the next day. He said he'd be here at 10, he's not coming. His aides tell us he can't travel because of the political unrest. When we ask if we can go to him, there's no answer. So we go see Jonas, the father. He lives in a poor neighborhood that still bears the scars of barricades and rioting. We want to know what Prophet Mackinson told them that day after we left. He and his wife sell secondhand shoes and dishes for a living. The family live in a hut measuring just 10 square meters. When their son fell ill, they did not take him to see a doctor. Why didn't you take him to hospital? I thought someone put a spell on him. That's why I took him to see the prophet. Was the child dying? He was already dead. He died in my arms on the way. They hoped Prophet Mackinson would be able to bring their child back to life. You really thought he could revive him? Yes, I was sure he could. I was told he did it often. You believed he could bring him back to life? Yes. Did the prophet ask you why you hadn't taken him to hospital? No, he only told me that the child had been sold to the devil so that someone could win the lottery. Prophet Mackinson didn't charge them for the consultation. He later told us that while he is able to revive people who've died because of a curse, he could do nothing to save the boy, who had died a natural death. If your second child falls ill, will you go to hospital or back to see the prophet? No, I won't go back. I'll go somewhere else. Another boko? Yes, a boko. A boko is a voodoo priest. A street theatre group called the Theatrical Intervention Brigade. Normally their performances are joyous, played to large crowds in busy streets. But their performance for us today is different. Demonstrations at the weekend turned violent, fed up with years of unemployment, crime and poverty, Protesters were asking what the government did with $3.8 billion from a Venezuelan oil deal. They threw stones and burned tires, and several were shot dead in the streets. Jenny is one of the group's founders. She explains that most of the actors couldn't make it to the performance. Everyone stuck at home because of the protests. There was a curfew imposed the night they started. Was there shooting? Yes, I could hear it from my house. Everyone's staying inside. The children are in bed. Schools are closed. No one's at work. There's no public transport. There are no cars on the roads because there are barricades everywhere. The group had wanted to perform one of their best-known pieces. We wanted to perform Brides and Grooms for you, but we couldn't. It wasn't the right time. The Haitian people are hurting. And we're hurting too. They created the group in 2011 after the earthquake destroyed many of Port-au-Prince's theatres. Our role is to break taboos, to say what's not said. So many topics are taboo in Haiti. Sexuality, homosexuality, politics, money, the middle class, inequality, gender equity. Brides and Grooms is a piece about different couples, gay men, gay women. Seeing two men together, they go crazy. An older white woman with a young Haitian man. A young Haitian man who needs to escape a life of poverty has two options. Either he seeks asylum 
or he finds a white man or woman and they get married for him to get a visa. But it was a piece about economic inequality that first brought the group to our attention. There's an event here called the White Dinner. People from the bourgeoisie get together for a fancy dinner. It costs about 160 euros. 160 euros? Yes, just for one dinner. We did our own version of the white dinner. We dressed up, chic, sophisticated with a caterer and all that, but we did it on a rubbish heap. Those dinners make me crazy. There are people who are dying of starvation. People are going without food while they're busy dressing up and eating fancy food. It's like there are two Haitis, one for the poor and one for them. Nieps takes us to meet someone else he told us about, Jean-Max Dumont and his son, Davinsky. Jean-Max is an electronics expert who's only had three months of formal training. Orphaned at 15, he couldn't afford the bus fare to get to university. I go online every day to learn things. C++, Python, HTML. I started with the basics. When Davinsky was two years old, Jean-Max noticed he wasn't responding to people's voices like other kids do. He suspected his son might have a speaking disorder known as selective mutism, but he couldn't afford to take him to a specialist. So he built a robot out of papier mâché and recycled parts. The robot's head is also made of papier mâché. There are LEDs for the eyes. The robot was a success. It's like they were friends. Davinsky started talking back to the robot and to people. This robot is called Haitian. <laughs> What's he called? The Haitian robot. Ah, it's a Haitian robot. He's now built a second robot. <laughs> After our article was published, Jean-Max got help from Haitians living overseas and a job with a local company specializing in automation for the home. But he wants to pursue his passion. In Haiti, there are no schools specialized in robotics. But elsewhere, in South Korea, France, Canada, and the EU, there are lots of them. His dream is to study overseas and bring what he learns back home. My real dream is to bring what I learn back to Haiti so everyone can have access to this kind of technology. That's it for this special edition of the Observer's Direct from Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Thank you to our observers. Thanks to France 24 for coming to see us. Maybe we'll come see you for the next Observer's Direct. Get in touch with our team. The details are right there on the screen. See you next time.